righty. Well, looks like we're having trouble with Rumble. Yes. Wait to start a Monday. Excellent. So, hope everybody had a good weekend. Um, I see that Tim is here. Lord Thoth has stopped in to say hello. See, what do we got going on here? Uh, Tim wrote, my granddad flew P-51Ds out of England. We went through went to a place he f we went to the place he flew out of in 09 on veterans day remembering remembrance day yeah over in england over a year after he died back in 08 um that's the same year my my dad died was in 08 the reason why he became a fighter pilot was that he flew under a bridge during the last training flight that he had in flight school, yeah. It takes a little bit of skill. Yeah, read on. They said to all the pilots it. don't fly. They said to all the pilots don't fly under the bridge, and he did. There was someone taking notes who did this. Some pilots did, and some didn't. Turns out the pilots who flew under the bridge became fighter pilots. There you go. That's an odd way of, of selecting a crew. And, no, that's that a clever way of doing it. Let's see who's got balls. <clears throat> but they, they disobeyed an order. So I don't know. Yeah. That's what you want on a, as a fighter pilot. Somebody who's uh, going to think on their heels. Hmm. So good morning, Andy. How are you doing? Good morning, D. Bud Martin. How are you doing, my friend? So it's Military Monday. We're not going to do a slideshow today because uh, there's nine no way to do a slideshow for nine hours worth of material. I'm just going to talk about the show and, and the impact it had on me. Um, and we'll say what it, impact it had on her. I'll talk about some of the history and how accurate the show was, which, you know, despite some of the changes they made, uh, was fairly accurate historically. And technically, um, my boss, Dale Dye, of course, was the senior military advisor on the series. Again, this is the third in the um, series of films that Tom Hanks, Steven Spielberg produced. Beginning with Band of Brothers and then followed by The Pacific. Ironically, <clears throat> this was not on HBO because HBO... Originally, it was this. Yeah. They've been planning this show for for years. Ten years. And the problem is, is that um, the Pacific, as good a show as it was, did not bring in new subscriptions, and it made HBO gun shy because of its two hundred fifty million dollar budget, and uh, they were scared to do it again. Iffy. Not interested. No matter how many times they brought it to him. I mean, they love Spielberg. They love Hanks. Uh, they just kept balking at doing it. And uh, eventually, Apple TV, Apple Plus TV, whatever they want to call it. I don't know. Apple TV Plus. I don't know. They are doing something. They have the lowest subscriptions of any of the uh, uh, providers. And yet they are just putting tons of money into projects out there. And Hanks had a really good relationship, so Spielberg, with Apple Plus TV because of um, Operation Greyhound. Uh, they loved it. They had a great subscription reaction to the film. And so a relationship began. And, of course, Dale was the senior military advisor, and he's brought into these things. It kind of bugs me with this new series how low down the totem pole he was put. Uh, he's a full minute into the final credits before his name shows up on this series. And I no, know I he puts a lot more. Down. Yeah, he puts a lot more into these projects than they give him credit for. And I expect better of Tom Hanks. I don't expect better from Spielberg. Because Spielberg's a bit of a shit heel with veterans. You know, if you're not a World War II veteran, he doesn't really care about veteran issues. So, 
that's a shitty thing. It and is. He gets, like, he's like, he makes a boot camp with the actors every time he's involved with stuff like that. I know. He does his things that it creates such great behind the scenes stuff for these projects. And he's not being brought on as a producer when he should be. Yes. Because he helps the project so much. But anyway, I'm not going to piss him on about it. it. Just I don't like people I love being treated badly. Well, Tuskegee Airmen, I asked him about what he thought of the film that Lucasfilm did, and he gave it a C. Yeah, it's not a very good film. The film, The Tuskegee Airmen, was actually a better film. But it's still not very good. I think this series did a better job of showing these guys. And I was really intrigued by something they did in this, because, again, this was adapted from the book. And uh, two books is adapted from the book with the title. And it was also adapted from, uh, oh, what is his name? Um, hold on. Major Crosby's personal biography, which is where they got the affair from because he admitted to it in his biography. And an interesting uh, side note on that is uh, there is a theory that the OSS um, officer that he was um, having a relationship with was none other than a young Princess Elizabeth. That's a theory, but I read somewhere that she's actually inspired by a real female soldier. That is not. I don't know. I don't know, because he withheld her name and anything about her personally. So I think it's a fun theory. mystery of it. It is. I think it's a fun theory. But, you know, I got to say, you know, despite me not liking Barry Keegan, I don't like him. He's the guy that plays the Joker in The Batman. Um, at the end there of the film, in the final credit scene or whatever the hell that was. Um, I really don't think much of an actor. He still pulled it off playing uh, uh, Lieutenant Curtis Biddick, who had probably one of the worst death scenes. And they really toned it down for the series because he his death was much worse than what they showed in the miniseries. So. Is he the one who gets stuck in the turret? No, he was the pilot. Oh, yeah, the pilot who tried to land the plane for his wounded co-pilot, yeah. Uh, just a, That was a horrible death. Bloody horrible death. <clears throat> uh, so Tim says, uh, yep, that is what they wanted. Guys who uh, took control Balls of their of own lives, you know. So years ago, I talked to her. Yeah, I saw the, I read that one already. Okay. Um so I hope everybody's having a good Monday. It's, um, I don't know, this Monday could start off rough. Joe's not here. We're expecting Joe. I'm hoping everything's okay with him. I'm worried about him because he, he doesn't, he's never not shown up before and he's not answering his phone. He's going straight to voicemail. So hope he's okay. I hope he just overworked and is sleeping. Uh, but um, there are so many things in this because we get a little bit of the, the, the missions, we get to see prison life for POWs in, in the German uh, prison camps at the time. We even get a, a nice little mention of the story of the Great Escape. Yeah, that's a, which I think those episode you, five. That's an homage to the Great Escape. They, um, you know, that is such a horrible story because as fun a film as it is and, and exciting a story, um, what was done was a war crime by the Germans where they captured a bunch of them, a bulk of them, and took them out to a field and then executed them by machine gun. Lied to them and told them to take smoke. <laughs> it Horrible. Fucking blew them away. And <clears throat> conduct unbecoming, man. And I do believe that um, the Germans got what they deserved in the post-war the Nuremberg trials. Uh, but in the end, um, it's odd how the Germans were treated one way in their, their war crimes to what happened with the Japanese. It's really weird. If you ever do read up on it, uh, treated totally different. And they were totally different wars. The war in the Pacific was closer to what it was like in Vietnam. Crazy. Crazy guerrilla warfare, crazy. 
Um, I remember I, my uncle told me stories of what it was like. He served in the, in the Pacific and uh, he was a Marine. And then, of course, I worked for a guy named Merrill Gitlin, who was a uh, uh, commando in the U.S. Navy during World War II. And he had some crazy stories of what they did in the Pacific Islands. The ja what I'm talking about with the Japanese, Tim, is that if you look at the outcomes and the punishments, completely different than the way they were handled with the Germans. Um, I did like that some of the German officers, SS, um, wanted to be shot. And that was refused because they were going to be treated like common criminals for what they did. And they were hanged. And that's why um, I think it was Goebbels um, tricked a guard into letting him have toothpaste. As I recall, it was toothpaste. Uh, and inside it was cyanide. And he took cyanide the night before his execution. Yeah, I think that was him. So, yeah, it's really almost um, shameful the difference between the way the Japanese were treated as war criminals compared to the way the Germans were. And I believe that what the Japanese did, when you look at it, was almost even more horrific. Well, they did. Uh, they things. marched people to death. Um. The Bataan Death March. Uh, not to mention, you know, the real story behind the, the bridges of the River Kwai. Because it wasn't just one bridge. It was bridges that they built, uh, the railroad. Uh, the way they treated the Koreans. The way they treated the Allied forces um, they had prisoner. The starvation. And um, they saw yeah. the Allies as subhuman. Not only and, the Koreans, the, the Chinese too. Oh, and the they Chinese, were, yes. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the uh, R-A-P-I-N-G of Nanking, it was a war crime. What was done in China was a war crime. And to be honest with you, I love the Japanese. I do. I love the Japanese people. I love Japan. But um, there was a period of time where they were just horrible people. And they were led by horrible people. Uh, they had outlawed for years the way of the samurai, but in the early 20th century, they started bringing it back in. And, um, and they, they perverted it. And, of course, um, Hirohito was not an emperor. He was a god in their eyes. To disobey him was to disobey an order from God. So really messed up culture. And, yeah, what's um, really messed up is this, that to this day they changed from the history not in schools. It was Gehring. Okay, Goebbels deleted himself before the Russians got him. Okay, thanks, buddy. Appreciate that. He knows his history. Yeah. Uh, Unit seven three one makes Doctor. Joseph Mengele looked like a saint. Yeah. Also, you know, I don't like, and I will never do the film uh, Bridget of the River Kwai movie. Um, not because I don't appreciate the cinema and everything that is and the acting in it, but because it's insulting to the real men that were there. Uh, they made it look like it was a British officer that betrayed and I blame that even on Pierre Buell, who, who wrote the book. He also wrote Monkey Planet that became Planet X. Um, he lied. He made it out to be a British officer that betrayed the, the prisoners, when in reality it was uh, collaborating French officers. But because Pierre was French, he made it out to be a Brit. And that David Lean allowed that to continue in the film and having Alec Guinness play that a traitor when the real British doctor that was in charge of that camp that helped everybody put his life on the line every day for every man that was held prisoner there in order to get them better care. Um, it's just untrue. It's a lie. And that's why I don't like it. I don't like films that just outright lie. It's not a historical film, not accurate at all. Uh, it's always the French. <laughs> I love the French people, but... I despise 
the government of France, and I despise in particular Parisians. They are just some of the worst fucking people I've ever met in my life. And yes, I've been there. Did not like them. I remember I, I got into a taxi cab and told him the name of the hotel I needed to go to. Uh, no Anglais, no Anglais. I said, the name is in French I just gave you. And every second you waste will cut, you know, cut into your tip. They and then he turned English. around and took me. Oh, he's such, French are such pricks towards They America. hate English so much that they have French The only thing they hate worse than English are, are uh, Americans. They despise Americans. Even though we're the ones that stopped them from uh, continuing being uh, controlled by the, the Yahtzees. So. It's such a weird mentality, if you ask me. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm used to that with Europe in particular. They're, you know, they have short memories. Um, hello, European here. I know, sweetheart. I'm just saying the countries tend to have, the European countries tend to have a short memory. You know what, what country doesn't and is just amazing to Americans? The Netherlands. Mm -hmm. they, they are so kind. They love... They love their history, man. Japan also has a huge history of internal conflicts. Oh, yeah, the feudal period. Oh, my God. Life was, we're going to be doing that, by the way. And I think we're going to do episode by episode with that one. We're going to do um, Shogun. Um, Shogun. Oh, because this is, great. I, I was like going into it going, oh, man, they're going to woke it up. It's going to be terrible. And I'm like, oh my God, this is more accurate than the original series. It's more accurate to the book and it's way more accurate to the feudal period. Life had little value in some places in Japan. The only thing I feel bad about is that they took all the color out because the Catholic robes in the first series were actually accurate. They had uh, adopted the um, orange color from the Buddhist monks. And that's why the Catholics wore orange robes in japan but it was only was it um most of it takes place in 03 1603 but by um 1614 um the the real tornaga outlawed christianity and it became an underground religion at, at that point and he expelled the catholics from japan um, I don't know, man, if I've got the um, wherewithal to do the entire series, but it's up to uh, Anima. I mean, this is your show with me now, too. You know, would no, you like they... to do the original series? Um, I would I do it as a one episode thing. I would not do the episode by episode. I was just going to suggest that, yeah. Mm. Um, but I haven't seen more than the first episode of the original series, so I need to watch that one first. Yeah, and it's only three episodes, I recall. It's only three episodes. Unlike this new series, which is, I think, what, 10? Is it 10 or 8? Something like that. I don't have time to look it up. Um, I can look it up. Yeah, at, and you know what? You bring that up, Shinatsuki. Uh, one of my favorite scenes was put back into um, uh, Apocalypse Now Redu Redux, as some people say it's just redo. Um, the X is supposed to be silent. Um I like them putting in the rubber tree plant plantation, rubber tree plantation Ten <laughs> uh, back into the film. In fact, we'll probably do two episodes per show and do it in five episodes for the new show gun. There's just so much to unpack with that series, but masters of the air. Um, I got to tell you, you get three, three major stories in here. You get to see the bombing missions. You get the red tail story. And you get to see the prisoner of war and the liberation. And it's intense. And some of it's really gut-wrenching. And like I said, when they show the death of Lieutenant Curtis uh, Biddick, uh, his death was probably one of the most brutal deaths. In his crash, they um, they they PG'd it up a lot and made it less graphic. And I think it was polite to do that because I think it would have been too rough on the audience and probably the the surviving family to see how he died. 
I think for all the changes they made for the series, they had valid reasons. Yeah. They didn't do it for drama or Hollywood stuff to make it more, I don't know. Yeah, and I'm not going to say there weren't uh, ra racists in in the military, but it is far less than what you see in a lot of popular films today, in particular. Um, and um, with the um, the you know the the red tails, the way they were they were loved by these bomber guys. They loved them. And uh, they didn't give two shits about the race. They just were beholden to these guys protecting them. Because the difference between America and Britain is uh, Britain owned the night and the United States tried to own the day and be masters of the year. I have not. Oh, wait. I remember that one. That's the one I brought up earlier. Oh, you weren't here. I brought that one up. Um, that was actually a much better film. It's not great though, but it's, it's a much better film. I feel this series did a better job depicting the red tails. I wish there was a little more of them, but we got a full episode dedicated to them, which is like a movie. And then you see them throughout the series because they're the ones who are protecting those B 17s from the hundred, uh, the hundredth, the bloody one hundredth. And the reason they, they got that nickname was because they had so many casualties. And the reason why is because Britain bombed at night and the U.S. bombed during the day. And the enemy could see us. They lost over 70% of their men. It's, it's ridiculous, the, the it's casualty terrible. rate. And, you know, my cousin Bud was one of those guys, served in, in, over there bombing Germany and places in France. Wherever the Germans were, they'd go bomb them. Lawrence Fishburne was in it. Yeah. A younger Lawrence Fishburne. Now, I'll tell you a funny story with him because I brought Apocalypse Now. Um, he was underage when they cast him. And the first, first time I heard this story was that they weren't aware that he was underage. But the fact is, is um, he lied about his age. The casting director didn't fall for it, but turned to somebody else and asked them, does he look like he'd be 17, 18 years old? And they said, yeah. He says, you're in. And that's how he got cast in that movie. His lie didn't work. But the fact is they wanted somebody who looked like a kid because that's what they were. They were kids fighting that damn war. Yeah, like 18 to 20. The average age of the Vietnam veteran is no, 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 19, 19. What was it Hard Castle that put that song up back in the 80s? It's one of my favorites because it, it talked about Vietnam veterans. And of course, my brother, Stephen, is a Vietnam veteran, Marine. And uh, so I have, yeah, that personal connection through my brother. So anyway, after reading Heart of Darkness, Pollux now is a different experience. Well, it is, because it was Francis Ford Coppola's attempt at, at adapting it as a war story. And it works. As, you know, the, my only problem was that uh, the real officer that uh, Marlon Brando represented, because it was a real guy, I forget his name right now. I got Hal Moore on the brain. It's not Hal Moore. Uh, he's actually, I think he's still alive. I don't think he's dead yet. He's, I think he's in his late 70s now. And uh, oh. he was a real person. And uh, he, they did not try to stop his command. He's the guy who took the fight in country using local militia to build his team of guerrillas as well as, as his commandos. And they were very effective. Uh, the most effective thing they had was him until Nixon bombed Hanoi. And then that's when shit changed. Also, Tet Offensive, you know, if you don't know your history, uh, if you listen to the left, we lost the Tet Offensive. No, we repelled them. More so, we wiped out the Viet Cong. I'm so during sick the Tet of Offensive. hearing that. We wiped them out. The Viet Cong didn't exist after the Tet Offensive. After that, all we were fighting with the, the NVA. And we beat them so badly, we forced them to the Paris peace talks. And they signed a treaty with us. 
It was our own Congress that betrayed the U.S. military and the Vietnamese people by defunding the war, and we were forced to pull out and not enforce the treaty. So those of you who don't know history, go read that. Learn what really happened. We get betrayed so often by politicians in this country. All the time. England, too. Not, England not just too. you. Well, England in particular. Right now, Canada is being betrayed by its politicians. But uh, England has been betrayed several times by their leadership. Oh, um, we have a super chat from Christian Delorme. Hey, Christian. Good morning, man. It's uh, Christian hey. Delorme's Vinyl Revival, $5 Canadian. Bonjour, everybody. I figured I should come in and give you my two cents. In this case, it's five Canadian pesos. Cheers. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you, Christian. You're, you're a good fella. You're a good fella, mate. You're a good fella. Um, you ever notice that uh, Brian never complains about my Scottish accent? <laughs> He knows there's no point in complaining. You want to do yes. what you do. <laughs> I do I'm true. doing an Aberdeen accent. <clears throat> I'm doing a proper Aberdeen accent. So I lived over there. Project Gamma. I didn't live in Europe, so I don't give two shits about European accents. But Come I do on, give a shit about my English and British accents and the Irish. Because I know the three distinct major Irish accents. Play Chris well. video. I don't know what video we're playing for. Him. What, what video? I don't know. It's your show. Oh, but you're in charge of that as the producer. Yeah, right. Do your um, job, man. Oh, no. do do not poke the bear, anima. Okay. <laughs> I poke <laughs> who I want. Dare you? The impudent! The audacity! The unmitigated gall! Well, whatever helps you sleep at night, bitch. That last one was from Martin. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. I I wanted to use the peace napalm. The what? The uh, the peace it... napalm. What the fuck word is that? I don't know. Peace, peace, napalm are the word that you use to name the video. Oh, hissing napalm. Clint Eastwood. It means be advised. And I mean nasty and tired. I eat Constantino wire and piss napalm. And I can put a round through a flea's ass at 200 meters. So you go hump somebody else's leg, mutt face, before I push yours in. Yeah, the one that we used was um, I can shoot a flea off a bull's ass at 500 yards. Or 400 and a half meters. A friend of mine was an EW on a B-52D during Vietnam, flew during lineba linebacker two, and did a few arc light missions. Very cool. My um, cousin Bud was a B-17 pilot, and uh, when he survived the war and they were coming back to the United States, he went off... Um, because they were supposed to be flying to northern Illinois where uh, the airbase was. But he went off path and buzzed our hometown, our my family's hometown, Charleston, Illinois, and flew right over the houses, and, which was really a fucking cool story. He got in trouble but didn't get in trouble. <laughs> well... <laughs> Oh, you better you better start taking off your clothes, Gary. <laughs> no, right. it's funny, so he keeps it on. my shirt. No, I'm not taking my clothes off. That's reverse strip of money. Put on more. Yeah, put more clothes on. <laughs> I've been married for 25 years. You can't hurt my feelings with videos. <laughs> <laughs> you won't stop trying, though, Christian. You know that. All right. So um, here you get this Dale Die video. God, he's got the military yell. Perfect. Oh, yes. Which is why he's been used in so many films, just for voiceover. Um, boy, I got to tell you, I found, I cannot find any place regionally that sells bitter marmalade. 
which is what I ate when I was over in, in the UK. Uh, I prefer over the French marmalade, which is the sweet one, because uh, it, it uses the bitter rinds of the, um, I forget the name of the um, orange that they use for bitter marmalade in England. But my God, it was, I just love it because it's a little hint of sweetness, but a hint of bitter too, like a coffee has. Yeah, that marmalade was one of the few good things that I got to eat when I was in Ireland. Really? Yeah. My host mom was a terrible cook. I was a vegetarian back then already. I was 16. And her idea of vegetarian food was just um, throw a bunch of vegetables into boiling water and leave it for a while. So I thought it might have saved me on that one. But yeah, her food was <laughs> terrible. And these untoasted sandwiches that taste like nothing with cheese in it that tastes like nothing. That was my school lunch. That was, yeah, thank you. No. <clears throat> I loved bad. eating breakfasts in Britain. I we'd stay in B and B's a lot and uh bed and breakfast. And so you get up in the morning and and uh they poach the eggs with the um with with griddle grease. They would flip the oil on top of it so we get that little thin film but not overcook the yolk. And you get this delicious toast. It was incredible. Ireland was wackadoodle uh with their food for breakfast i was not as big a fan of the irish bread bed and breakfast as i was the english and when we went to throughout europe like in paris uh and in uh, you know outskirts of france because we went to versailles and um stayed in the b&b there and uh i really loved the british i mean the french breakfast too except the fact that the marmalade was jelly it was sweet there was something very special about the British and the way they make marmalade. So anyway, back to the comments. Um, I think this show also touches on English life. And I really love that they show the kids and they represent the kids with real children that were um, named after real, the real kids that were there at that air base. The little boy that was missing an arm was based on a real kid. And uh, I really like that. And at the end, you know, it's really hard. They're saying bye to the Americans and they're really going to miss them. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> the interactions were great between the soldiers and the English kids. I really like that. And, you know, there's something that happens at the end of your duty. It's like, because um, you think you just, this is going to go on for forever. You really do. And then all of a sudden one day you're pulling up stakes and going. It's just that quick. It's, it's over. And uh, in the military, it just I would get really melancholy because I, I would miss the guys I served with. And I, I, I did. I, it broke my heart. Well, Saying you get really close. The guys. Uh, you're like I family want, while you deployed. Uh, Ludwig Castle someday. I'll tell you the one I want to go to is the castle or a palace uh, that the Disney palace is based on, which is uh, uh, Lichten, Liechtenstein. And it's so fucking beautiful. And I've seen so many castles in England and Ireland. And I was showing uh, Anima that uh, the singer who sang Lady in Red, uh, Krista Berg, uh, bought a castle, lived in it, and then he converted it uh, into a hotel. And he still lives in it to this day. While also leasing out rooms in it. He had it fixed up so it's insulated on the inside that must cost a, cost a pretty penny but uh i'd oh, love yeah. to stay in this castle i was in london last year at this time i sent my oh sorry <laughs> i sent my friend from high school a text in the uk send real food <laughs> you can get great food in, in i like kippers i gotta be honest they have great food i, I like just happen to live in a family that's like a shitty cook as a mother I also really, um, I liked my, my English breakfast and food. I ate the shit out of uh, steak and kidney pie. Uh, I lived off that. If I wasn't eating that, I was eating gyros, or as they call them, doner kebabs. And I would eat um, uh, peanuts and Coke. I would take a bottle of Coke, pop the top off, and pour a bag of peanuts into it. It was taught to me by my dad. Because that's how they had it when they were kids. And it's really very good. So weird. I was at Dover Castle and went to Canterbury Cathedral last year. Yeah, it's it's something else. And there's so little of it. You know, the original cathedral left. It's a ruin. 
ruin, Brian, ruin. Ruin, yes. But I love British food. And I hear people talk shit about it. I've had uh, sausages and ba- or what do they call it? Uh, mashing bangers. Mashing, yeah, yeah, mashing bangers. Uh, I've had Scottish food. I've had um, uh, in the sheep gut. What's that called? I forget. Haggis. Haggis. I've had haggis. It's actually really fucking good. I think that's an acquired taste, probably, but they do have a lot of great food. Well, it was sounds- it Neuschwanstein? Neuschwanstein, um, yeah. That's I know it was one of them. It's the same probably, designer. It's the same designer. The most, most famous of the castles. Everybody yeah, but it's the same them. designer that built them. Uh, that's why they all have very similar designs. But uh, haggis is gross, says a British guy. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's, no a Austrian, there's a lot of Austrian English food that I find English prefers to eat, <laughs> you know, we like our black pudding. <laughs> like that's yes. really good. Blood pudding. What are you, Klingons? <laughs> <laughs> um, please, St. Patrick's Day, don't remind me of Irish food. Um, what I discovered in Ireland, everything is fried. <laughs> Look, even the bread that we were served for breakfast. Not just Ireland, dude. wasn't baked, it was fried. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> Scottish people fry everything, too. But... Uh, I did. I, I got to tell you, you know, it's a hell of an experience that I had as a, a young man, uh, getting to go all over Europe and uh, enjoying the food. I had a, a real Italian pizza, which uh, had no sauce on it. It had it was um, crumbles of fish, uh, real mozzarella, and uh, olive oil. On a very like cracker like crust, it was very crunchy and it was very, yeah. Good. Um, uh, if I remember correctly, the sauce on pizza is only for from uh Sicily, the rest of yeah. the country uses it without the without sauce, yeah. By the way, um, Mars bars was my favorite candy bar in, in England because it is basically, um, a Milky Way with, um, that's not almonds. I think it's peanuts, isn't it? What, Mars I can't bar? remember now. Mars, Mars in bar. Europe? No, that's just um, the fudge and caramel and then chocolate around it. No nuts. That's what it was. That's what it was. Yeah. Cause, that's not Mars bar. Because Mars is made by the same candy manufacturer. It makes Milky Way and Snickers. And yeah. they do. You can find the Mars bar here in the United States. You can and it is different than um, Milky Way. It is different. Uh, another one uh, I like was the Three Musketeers by Mars. Really good candy bar. It's got um, fluffed milk nugget. It's really good. It's like, I noticed as, even as a kid, why does this big Milky Way, or I mean uh, um, Three Musketeers bar, weigh less than the smaller Milky Way? I don't get it. And the reason why is because it's fluffed on the inside. So it has a lot of air in it, air pockets. Britain loves pudding like it loves invaders black. <laughs> uh, high fiber diet bring a whole new meaning to the trouble. Also, uh, England is where I had my first uh, poached egg, a real poached egg in, in its shell. Where it's soft boiled. That's soft boiled. Poaches without. Yeah, soft boiled is what I meant. Soft boiled and crack the tap off, and you take your corner of your toast. I prefer my toast done on one side, as the English would say. <laughs> but um, I love the I, I love the, the Mars bar over there, and I love Donner kebabs. But I remember uh, an expose done on, I think it was either forty eight hours or sixty minutes, and. Um, that people were going blind because certain precautions weren't being taken by the health department with how those people were storing their meat in those um, kebab windows. Uh, they had a big set of beef and lamb. They, they, it, somehow the bacteria attacked the um, mm. optic nerve and they went wow. blind from it. 
and it scared the crap out of me. Spotted dick. Care for a spotted dick? Um, you'll like this one, Andy. I, was, I went into a hey, tea house in London, and um, this gentleman walked up to me. He says, would you care for a spot of tea? And I went, no, I'd prefer a whole cup. Thank you. Hi, Boosh. And he goes, oh, great. American. <laughs> <laughs> you wonder why you have a bad reputation over you. That is Gary like spotted dick. I've had spotted dick. It was okay. It was okay. Look, I tried the whole thing when I was over there. Anything that the British ate, I ate. I wanted to, the whole experience to learn. Same thing when I went to France. I wanted to eat what French people ate. I didn't want to eat American food. It's what you should do when you travel. Else you can just stay home. I used to hit the Donner uh, place after boozing in Manhattan. Good stuff. Prevents hangovers. Uh, and all a Donner kebab is is a euro. It's just Turkish. These are Turkish shops in London. In fact, there used to be a nice row of restaurants right out in front of Big Ben, right next to the uh, underground. And um, we ate at quite a few of them, a little hole-in-the-wall restaurant that had great meat pies. And I would get steak and kidney pie there when we were in London. How did we derail from us as a Hello, student? Benny. It's all connected. The Donner <laughs> kebabs were not stored. Hey, we don't have a fucking slideshow, so... Stored yeah. probably after closing. It only takes <laughs> four hours for the back. Yeah, and that's what was happening. And so people started getting sick from it. And in, in the expose, they had a, a man and a girl. And she was like a teenager, went blind from it. Because the bacteria attacked the optic nerve in the brain. Uh, very scary wow. shit. Yeah. Hey, why do you girls, guys spell they're not like that? I've never seen it with two N, ever. I don't know. Um, I thought that's how it was spelled. No. What? Donner kebabs. No. It's Döner and with one N. At least in Europe. You might have your own spelling over there. Just to me, it's weird. I don't know. I've never really spelled it. Hold on. Let me put it in chat. Yeah, it's just one N. It's just one N. And this is what I would eat uh, in London. Uh, fucking Donner kebabs. They were really good. Elsewhere, shawarma or uh, gyros. Hey, Redshirt, how you doing, buddy? Hi, Redshirt. Still haven't heard from uh, Joe. I'm, I hope, God damn it, I hope he's okay. I hope he's just sleeping in. But it I've sucks. just never seen him not respond. Yeah, he really wanted to be there. Yeah, he told his show that he was going to be here today. And so it's I don't weird know. that he's not. Nope. And he's not responded to me yet. Uh, oh, wait. Oh, wait. Something just happened. He may be responded. Oh, well. Yes, um, everything is great. Haven't seen Masters. Plus, Foxy got the day off. Oh, it's sex day. Joe's having sex. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Spread the word. Make sure you tell him I said so. <laughs> Why did he say though that he wanted to be here on his show? I don't know. I don't know. And he has he has been here without having seen the stuff we're talking about. Yeah, I know. <laughs> He's so, like, he'll walk in that, that's weird. Yeah. I've got no idea what we're talking about, but I'll, I have an opinion on a lot of things. <laughs> well, usually you and him are just talking about stuff when that happens. Redshirt, did like, you yeah, see okay. the show? You're welcome to join us if you want to talk about it. Yeah, hop on, man. I think he's. I think you and I follow each other. Oh man! Oh, and wow! <laughs> <laughs> that what happened? Trick. No, no, no. <laughs> What no? <laughs> you limey son of a bitch. <coughs> Sorry. I've had a rough weekend and I'm still not on top of things. Caught a bug or something. I don't know. Hey, 
There he is. He says, I don't have the streaming service that this is on. You don't need to have anything. You just click the link. Oh, I mean, I think he's that talking he's, about the show. Oh, he's yeah, yeah, there's other ways of watching it. There's ways. But he's, he's saying that he doesn't want to join because he hasn't seen it. That's fine. I haven't seen it either, and I'm so happy with you not talking about it so you can spoil it for me. <laughs> well, I'll spoil it for you right now. We won the war. Oh, my God. So, anyway, um, the series follows the ups and downs of this unit and the difficulties that they faced. Um, the fear. And it's so funny they would talk about it that, that they would live every day just having a blast and then there would be those few hours that, that they dreaded where they would be flying over Europe again. And then they'd come back and just live their life like it was the last day of their life. Teak, and you I do guess realize, that, hold on, Teak, they have their masks on because they're at an altitude where, where it is needed. They're just being realistic. I don't know why you have yeah, a problem there, with that. Yeah, there was that. nothing wrong with that. That is absolutely accurate the way they depicted that. Dependent on the altitude. Um, the gunners probably had it the worst because they had to remain, the guy in the, the ball turret, uh, the belly gunner. That was the most dangerous position. In the He had to stay masked pretty much the entire flight. Uh, Bush wants you to read this. Uh. Gary, I destroyed my teacher's mind for a calorie count. Carbohydrates provide four calories per gram. Protein provides four calories per gram. And fat provides nine, nine calories per gram. Sounds about right. Units of energy. Yeah. It's all a calorie. And then, yeah. and then? I bought a can of Guinness. <laughs> hey, meal in a can. Yep. That's what it was called. Uh, the other one was, uh, what was the major one that they, they had some problems with? Um, let me go back, see if I can find Jason? that one. One of the bloodiest ones they had, it starts with a B. Oh, no, it was R, Regensburg. Regensburg, yeah. Schweinfurt Reg Re Regensburg was just bloody. Because at that point, you know, they didn't have the P-51s yet, and they had no protection, and uh, the Messerschmitts owned the air. It didn't work for his math. Um, what was this? That's their real names, Teague. It would have been wildly disrespectful to change their names just to make them different. You need to get over that, man. Really. I don't, it's no big That's their name. names. I mean, yeah, it's their names. It's what they were called. It's based on two books. I didn't find it hard to know who is who at all. Not at all. Uh, I knew who was talking. I mean, fucking Dreamy, what's his name? I mean, when he talks, that drawl he's got, geez, man. Um, Do you mean Austin Butler? Yeah, Austin Butler when he's talking. I'm such a huge fan. It's ridiculous. Oh, you're turned on by him. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, I liked Ke Callum Turner. He was a weird-looking dude, uh, the actor. He looks like he was drawn by John Byrne, the comic artist. The, the high cheekbones, defined lines in his face. Um the only actor, Anthony Boyle, had a look all his own. Oh, yeah. Um, and he looks like straight out of that time, too. Yeah, he does. Um, even though he looks nothing like the real Crosby. Uh, but Crosby is kind of a goofy looking guy with weird ears. But um, I don't know. It's, it, I just enjoyed this show so much. And I didn't want it to end. I, I wanted to see Me more Me, too. Me too. You I'm know. so sad it ended. The big surprise was Spielberg's kid was in it. Uh, he played one of the pilots. Um, what is his name? Um, Sawyer. 
Spielberg. He is the son of uh, Kate Capshaw and uh, Steven Spielberg. The one actor I didn't like, but he still did a good job, was Barry Keegan. I could, I can't stand that guy. I just can't stand him. Something about his face pisses me off. Um, I think were there any other standout roles in the in the show? I'm looking at it. I just don't see anybody else that really stood out in the show. The young lady was really good. Yes, I liked her. What was her name? Andrea? Something like that? Andrea? Oh, I forgot. I can't find her. Oh, uh, the actor who plays Doctor Who now, um, he was in it too. He played one of the pilots. Amazingly, didn't act like he was, you know. Dude, that cast list is endless. So you mean you don't have to act that way? Interesting. Fun fact, the whole that's the whole nine yards, the length of bullets in the turret. Was nine yards. Ah, that's a good bit of trivia. I didn't know. I had no idea that was what that meant. Sandra Westgate. That's the character's name. I found her. Somebody messaged me. No. No, he's actually a good actor. Takes after his mother. Thank God. <laughs> I'm not a Spielberg fan. Really? How did notice? Just message me. Oh, it's a message from Instagram letting me know I have unread messages. Thanks. <laughs> Don't care. You need to turn off your phone, Gary. Well, I turn off the volume. It just hums now. Uh, now Bush is all giggly. <laughs> it's, there's always going to be a tidbit here and there that people are going to know more than I do. I'm, I'm okay with that. I like learning. Uh, flight scenes that were filmed in replica B 17s using technology known as the volume, which was also used on Mandalorian. The B 17s were suspended 50 feet in the air on a gimbal inside a 360 degree stage of seamless LED panel screens. And that's how they filmed all the in cockpit scenes and inside the plane where we saw the outside. Three B 17 replicas were built from scratch for the filming of this film. Uh, they were exact replicas. And they had one that was a bit bigger to allow two, camera crew inside. Two were exact replicas. The other was slightly larger to allow more room for the camera crew to move around in, even though it's still very accurate. It was larger inside so the camera crew could move around. They had intense training so, for getting in that cockpit because it was so narrow. Yeah, they were taught how to get in and out. Sometimes the cast filming in the replica B-72s were left in the cockpit for up to seven hours as it was so difficult for the actors to get in and out in the suspended cockpit. I'm assuming that they would probably like use a pole to put food up to them. Here's your food, but I got to take a shit. Here's the porta potty. <laughs> you can go seven hours without eating. Uh, when you're underneath those lights, you you want to eat. You want to mm -hmm. also stay hydrated. The 100th bomb that group is. became known as the Bloody 100th due to the heavy volume of losses it incurred in combat missions uh, and minute percentage of survival, minute percentage of survival. Yeah, like I say, over 70% mm -hmm. died. The series was logistically a huge undertaking with over 3,000 crew working on the film. And it, it is a, a larger budget than what was on um, the Pacific. They were originally, they had planned to shoot for a smaller budget with HBO, but a HBO would still balk at it. They just wouldn't do it. And so Apple took the hook and ran with it. And it's been huge hit on Apple. Massive hit for them. Lots of subscriptions from, from just this show. 
So I see a big future for because Dale Dye said that they're um, talking about another series as well as his film and uh, Operation Greyhound Part Two. So there are negotiations going on with Apple right now. So I'm excited about it. Uh, so it was a huge logistic uh, undertaking with over 3,000 crew working on all nine episodes. Steven Spielberg has said this is the biggest project he has ever worked on. Some of the 100th Bomb Group veterans who attended the Masters uh, of the Air premiere said they were holding on and reliving just uh, the moments just to be able to watch the series, <laughs> hoping not to die. <laughs> John Lucky Luckadoo, one of the last living members of the group, said at the premiere watching Mass of the Air, made him feel like he had just flown another mission. Um, it's so up close and personal when they're in those planes. Because those are tight quarters, man. Um, Callum Turner, Austin Butler, and Nate Mann were taught by military pilots on how to take off and land B-17s using flight simulators. So they actually learned on flight sim simulators how to perform their function. That's interesting. Actually, also they Butler learned, said in an interview that he really felt like he could fly any plane after that. Well, train. they learned the use of every single button and switch yep. in the cockpit and were constantly tested by their supervisors on the film of what each switch and button did. In given situations, your engine three is on fire. What do you do? <laughs> that must have been fun. Uh, prior to filming, the cast bonded during their two-week boot camp run by former U.S. Marine Captain Dale Dye, a Vietnam veteran who also advised Band of Brothers and the Pacific. The learning was holistic and included classroom sessions, hearing more about World War II. Actors also called on each other by their characters' names and rank during boot camp uh, to condition them to the military hierarchy. Which is one of the, I, I got to be honest with you, one of the hardest things to really learn and understand and boot and in, in basic. Uh, during film, Callum Turner, Austin Butler, uh, Nate Mann, and David Shields played a game that the real pilots played in, in, in real life. Rather than use the stairs to get up into the B-17s, they would race to see who could do the reverse pull-up from the ground and swing their bodies up into the cockpit faster. Yeah, you see that a lot. You see them get in like that a lot. Yep. Uh, Callum Turner, Austin Butler, and Nate Mann had a day where they specifically learned and practiced step-by-step -step sequences of how to get into their seats in the B-17 cockpits. Because the cockpits were very narrow and cramped, the actors had to nail the exact way they got into the pilot seats and make it look second nature and not like they're actors trying to pull it off. They did a Masters job. of the Air was 10 years in the making, which we explained why HBO kept balking at it. What they were doing is they kept trying to rework the budget, trying to get a green light, and they couldn't do it. Finally, they went to uh, Apple. Apple went for the full budget, $265, $265 million. But that's a, a big series, and each episode's an hour long. And that's incredible. They pulled that off. It's amazing what they did. Callum Turner's American accent in Masters of the Air is based on Major John Egan's real-life New York accent. He faked it derived from his obsession of the Yankees and and New York, even though he'd never been to New York once in his life. Uh, the series consists of an enormous ensemble cast across nine episodes. There are over 300 speaking parts. Wow. The B-17 Flying Fortress evolved through numerous designs, which I told you about that including the last one, which was the G, I think, becoming the third most produced bomber of all time behind the four-engine consolidated B-24 Liberator and the multi-role twin-engine Junkers uh, 88, the JU-88. Between takes and during filming breaks, the cast would play authentic games from the time period such as card games and dice games that were played by the veterans of World War II. So... But we're at the top of the hour, first hour, so I know what time it is, Martin. Do your thing, and we'll be right back. Yes. Meet the Seattle Vigilante. Like so many comic heroes, this warrior hides his identity. But his identity isn't the only secret he has to keep. After grievous wounds received during combat, Tier 1 operator John Russell begins to recover 
and comes to terms with his new reality of being an amputee. And as he learns how to use his new prosthetic limb, he finds himself caught up in the bureaucratic red tape that too many wounded veterans experience, the exhausting med board process. Out of sheer frustration, John takes it out on the criminal scum of the city. But when reality kicks in, John realizes he started something that's having an impact on the greater world around him, and thus has to reevaluate his motives. And moreover, just how far is John willing to go to finish this war he's declared against the criminals in Seattle? And will he even survive? From the creator of IDW's award-winning graphic novel, Code Word Geronimo, comes a new story about a different kind of warrior, Vindicated Inc., the first of its kind disabled veteran action hero comic. The Vindicated Inc. graphic novel crowdfunding campaign on FundMyComic.com is provided in the description of this video. We hope you become a contributor. Please share this link. Thank you. All right. We are back. Um, I stand correct. It was two hundred fifty million for this, um, and with the budget of over two hundred fifty million, Masters of the Air has now become the single most expensive television series ever produced. Austin Butler had just a week's break from completing shooting on Elvis to filming Masters of the Air. Do you during know how long that took, Gary? During Hold on. During production, he worked with a dialect coach to lose his Elvis accent. Shooting Elvis took three years. Imagine how it must have been for him to jump into a character. Well, so you do things. something like that. It's sort of like, um, uh, like your signature. My my signature was changed when I started signing artwork, and I had to sign over ten thousand art prints. And by the time I got about halfway through, my signature was permanently changed to what it is now. Uh, because of uh, trying to sign so many, I was speeding up my signature and it started just mm. becoming this really weird squiggly thing, which even Drew Struza says, that's a very cool signature that you've got. And my son, Benjamin, said, Dad, do you hate me? I went, no, I love you, buddy. Why? He says, because it looks like your name says gay kill. <laughs> what? No. <laughs> he did. That's a true, true story. Uh, so it was hard for him to lose that accent. In fact, he slips into it every once in a while and it weirds him out, weirds other people out because he was doing the accent for so freaking long and it changed the way he spoke. And he was on a talk show and he tried to do the different Elvis and then he realized and he laughed and everybody laughed because it's like, oh my God, I'm, I'm talking in the, my, my Elvis voice. And he says, it's hard to lose. It's just, it's become part of me. But yeah, three years is a long time. And he said in an interview, he had to find out who he was when they when they uh, were done filming. Yeah, because you play somebody for that long, it, it can impact yeah. you. Just like, uh, the abbreviation, my interest in all this and shit. So. The abbreviation USAAF stands for the United States Army Air Force, which was part of the United States Army and did not become independent of the Army until weeks after Roswell, 1947. Not a coincidence. The miniseries was originally going to be made by HBO, but they kept balking at it, like I said. The time of Major Egan in London in episode four is how Donald Miller opens up the book upon which the series is based. The working title of the series originally was Whirlwind. This is Barry Keegan's first World War II project since Dunkirk, which I hated. I did not like that film. This is a... Bell Pauley's first series for Apple TV since the morning show. Uh, let's see. Austin Butler watched footage of the real life Clevin, who was interviewed about his time as a bomber pilot when he was in his 80s. The footage helped Austin learn Cleveland's speaking cadence. He wasn't the only humor. one. A lot of them did that. So, and that's everything they've got on uh, IMDb about the film or the series. I really did like this show. Um, let's see if I can find some. Did you have favorite moments? Did I? Well, what yeah. were yours? Well, I could tell you one right off the top of my head is when, uh, what's his name, Miller? 
he works like three days without sleep and then he finally collapses and sleeps and when he wakes up he finds out that he slept through oh yeah three days been unconscious for three days um let's see i don't know for me i really think it was the mission where they ended up yeah the the uh Find for it, uh, Regensburg mission where they ended up flying down to uh, uh, North Africa. I thought that was really cool. Oh, the moment the, when um, when Butler tells his his boys, "We're going home," and they get so emotional that they arrive home. That was great too. Very tear uh, tear tracking though. Yeah, I'm trying to see if uh, they talk about it in here in the synopsis but i'm not seeing it because wasn't it on the regensburg mission that um uh biddick is killed i think so i think it was the mission he died on yeah, yeah anybody who was in the uh, army air force that stayed in after 45 uh eventually in 47 it became the u.s air force uh, you've got Jimmy Stewart who stayed in his entire adult life uh, and retired an officer. And he was an actual pilot. Uh, people make the mistake of thinking uh, Clark Gable was also a pilot. He was not. He was a gunner. Um, in fact, I remember reading... Um, same thing with Jimmy Stewart, that he was involved in uh, the war of Vietnam because he was still serving as a commander. <clears throat> the Regensburg raid was in landing in Africa was maybe the best part of the series. That, that, was, that was my favorite too. Uh, I really liked that episode. Even though that is the episode, I'm positive that's when Biddick got killed. I'm pretty sure that is, yeah. Yeah, it was a different generation, you know, and people think, oh, everybody was drafted. No, a lot of people volunteered, wanted to serve. Uh, and it's the only time we've ever seen anything like that. The rest of our, our society kind of went downhill where it became more about me personally rather than my country, which is something I couldn't understand. My, my bosses couldn't understand it, Gerhardt and Laura. When I left a, a very nice job and I was in school, to go serve in the military. I said, I want to serve. <laughs> and I knew things were heating up in the Middle East. I was fine with it. Grandfather on mom's side was infantry and became army intel and other cousins. Dad's side went officer and was placed in Coast Guard. By the way, I'm doing a new book cover um, for uh, uh, Brian Boland. He's uh, author of uh, two previous books that I did covers for uh, dealing with the Coast Guard. And I've told people, I said, um, I've known guys that served in the Coast Guard that were out on boats. And I'm telling you, these guys have seen what we would call combat, but they refer to as uh, police procedure. Their gunfights weren't considered firefights because they're considered, they arrest and detain. So the Coast Guard is more like police of the ocean. But they see a lot of combat with these drug runners. And in fact, I posted a really cool video of a Coast Guard cutter catching a, a, a drug running sub submarine. It's really fucking cool. And they're yelling, you know, we will sink you if you do not open your sub up and surrender. Uh, maybe you have that kind of face blindness. I, I don't know. I zero trouble knowing who is who. But, you know, it's it's an interesting uh, issue because this is something that has been brought up previously about military films, uh, combat films, is knowing who is who. But maybe it's because I'm a veteran. I automatically see the differences of people in uniform. Other people seem to have a problem with it. Hollywood people, in particular, um, they they seem. I don't to have, have problems like that. 
and I'm not aware. Um, I know that in my book, the artwork shows it uh, that Richard Bonk drew. Uh, I wrote the the story. Um, uh, uh, I just forgot the name of my own book. <laughs> Part of the Earth Force <laughs> series, uh, Transmission. <laughs> Uh, where the men are walking around in pro masks. And I said, I can't have them walking around in actual military pro masks. I got to make it a little sci-fi with fa face masks so you can see their faces and know who's talking because you wouldn't be able to tell. But, it le you know, that also leads to a joke I made in the Army when I it was raining and everybody was standing outside of a latrine waiting to get back on the road marching. And... I walked up the hill up into a platform that overlooked where all the soldiers were and everybody's standing there in their ponchos. Okay. And they're all wet. It's raining. Okay. It's muddy. It's gross. And they're trying to stay warm. So they're all stomping their feet, moving around. And I walked up to the platform where all the senior drill instructors were. And I came up behind him, walked in there. Cause I'm a squad leader. I'm wanting to find out if they want me to do anything. So I go up there. And I hear one of the drill instructors say, I don't know what I'm looking at. And I look down over it next to them. They don't even, they're not even aware of me yet. And I said, kind of looks like a tossed salad. <laughs> and they both looked at me and they chuckled and they said, what are you doing here? And I said, I just want to know, drill instructor, what you want her to do is next. You know, do you want us to form up? And he goes, yeah, go form them up. So I went down there and told Julio, who is our, leader uh, platoon guide gary ships were torpedoed and dive bombed in the pacific funny name for such a hostile environment oh what does he mean torpedoed and dive bombed i i don't know <coughs> i think he's What's a funny name torpedoed and dive bombed i don't know there's a joke in there for him i'm not getting it uh, Oh, maybe Venture. because somebody mentioned Pacific, Pacific Theater, and, uh, that, that is weird. Yes, yeah, the, the joke is funny name, uh, the Pacific, funny name for such a hostile place. Oh, the pacifist, I get it. Okay. Oh. It's about the Pacific. Now I get it. Um, the issue is in combat only. They are faceless, all the same name and same voice do. Mike's I know it's accurate. They're hard to track through. That's fucking war. That makes it even yeah, more. Yeah, I mean, me. positions. You know who is who by their positions on a plane. If you follow. Uh, it. And also, I don't think the voices sound the same. At all. Nothing alike. No, uh, no. I had to part with them when I came to Mexico. Huh. Didn't Gary talk about Band of Brothers talking shit about the shot of the men walking across the ridge? No, that's that's in um, um, uh, the, the movie no. uh, Saving Private yes, Ryan. Yes, Ryan. You were told to avoid to ridge answer. ridge lines, and they walk over a ridge, making themselves perfect silhouettes. You're taught not to do that. Basic. World War Two. Also, don't make yourself a silhouette. Yeah, I, I finally figured it out. Yeah. Did we do a show about Band of Brothers? I know we watched it and we talked a lot about it, but did we do a show? I don't show? know if we ever did. I don't think we did. I, I wouldn't mind doing a, it sometime. Yeah, we planned that anyway. That, we I am a big three. fan of that series. It's just such a well done series. Yeah. But out of the three, this one is my favorite. Now, according to um, Time Out magazine, Mass of the Air is true story, the historical facts and fiction in Steven Spielberg's new World War II epic. The historian behind the new Band of Brothers answers the big questions. First, there was Band of Brothers, then the Pacific, and now Q Stirring Marshall, drumbeat, whatever. Uh, comes Tom Hanks and what a Phil de Sim Simlian. You're a dickhead. Uh, Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg's third small screen World War II epic Masters of the Air goes bigger and higher uh, and, than even those two previous depictions of combat. The budget is colossal. The cast is full of established names with Austin Butler, Callum Turner, and Barry Keegan as headliners. 
the UK locations are historical in their own right, and a spectacle is unrelenting. Based on the book by historian Donald L. Miller, uh, Masters of the Air follows the men of the United States Army Air Force's 100th Bomb Group based in Norfolk and led into combat by Major Gail Buck Clevin, played by Butler, and John Bucky Egan Turner. These young American flyers, mostly in their early 20s and total newbies to high altitude flying, would clamber aboard the B-17 bombers and proceed at fairly serene speeds over the Third Reich, braving Luftwaffe fighters and constant German flak uh, to, in order to drop their bombs. Thanks to their advanced Norden bomb sites, which was a major part in the film, I really liked that they focused on that. Uh, you did not, if that plane was going to crash, you made sure that thing was destroyed. You did not want it being recovered by the Germans. Well, they have an argument when they try to get to Africa and not go down over the ocean when Buck tells them, throw everything overboard, ammo, everything. We need to lose weight. Everything. And one of one of yeah. them tries to argue with him and he's like, we're over water. They're not going to get it. Just throw it out. Yeah, it's heavy. It's It will it was, sink. Well, it was drilled into them not to leave anything around. So he was reluctant to just toss it out of the plane. But there was no way for the uh, Germans to recover any of that. Is Masters of the Air a true story? Well, of course, affirmative. The major characters are based on the real American airmen. Uh, and special attention was given to researching their stories and accurately representing uh, what they endured. Everything that happens in this happened in real life, says Miller. Every actor plays a real person. War has enough color and fury and agony to carry itself without embellishments. What was the bloody hundredth? Uh, I don't really care about that. Uh, who was Major John Egan? The show's lead is British actor Callum Turner, Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grimwald, who plays Major John Bucky Egan. Quote, I urge people to watch Egan's eyes in the series, notes Miller. This guy is a wild man, a heavy drinking Irishman, chasing women, reckless. You see the gleam in his eye. There's a twinkle. There's a twinkle in his eye. Uh... Yeah, you see the gleam in his eyes, then watch him on a mission, and his eyes are almost stationary and calm. There's a deep seriousness he worries about himself and his crew. Uh, what was the most dangerous place on the plane? A pilot absolutely says Miller of the worst place to be sitting in a B-17 over Germany. Everything was up front in the B-17, so it was the quickest way to disable the plane. Luftwaffe pilots would target the cockpit and cause absolute chaos on the plane. What did bomber crews fear the most? In the air, peril came in two main guises, anti-aircraft fire from the ground, flak guns, and fighter attacks, usually in front. Flak was terrifying in, in a different way, explains Miller. Fighters would bring the men through working in a coordinated fashion to survive with flak, they just sat there and just took it. And it is scary knowing that with every little air burst you saw, there's like pounds, like a uh, hundred yeah. pounds of shrapnel being thrown at you. And those planes were just covered by some kind of skin. That was very one Oh, I'm sorry. One gunner described it to me as being like someone strapping you in a chair and sitting you in front of a shotgun and saying, it might shoot you. It might not. <laughs> wow. I think that's really uh, uh, accurate description of what flak is. How easy was it to escape in a burning 17? It's pretty easy, says Milo. The hardest was the British Lancaster bomber, which was designed to imprison guys inside. It had a very narrow escape hatch, and a lot of men died because they couldn't get out in time. Who does Barry Keegan play? Uh, oh, they had to bring up Saltburn. What a piece of shit movie. <sighs> Barry Keegan. I'm just saying, I'm fucked at. Uh, Keegan plays a cool under fire, uh, fire pilot, Lieutenant Curtis Biddick, who is a sideline in a bar fighting RAF men. Our screen artist picked up on Biddick and put him into the story, says Miller. He gets into a bar fight and knocks a guy out with one punch. Uh, and, of course, you know he was killed. Uh, were downed airmen often murdered in cold blood? One of the most jarring scenes in Masters of the Air, spoiler warning, comes when a group of downed crewmen is set upon by civilians in a bombed German town. 
this was very common occurrence. Um, they would get angry and attack and kill the flyers. That scene was heartbreaking. Who were the Tuskegee Airmen? Uh, later episodes of Master of the Air, directed by Mudhounds D. Uh, D. Reese, introduced the unit of black fighter pilots known as the Tuskegee Airmen, played by uh, Mikudo uh, Gutway, Josiah Cross, as well as others. During the war, they flew out of the bases in southern Italy, explains Miller, and served as bomber escorts. I've heard some people bitching that we use them and they weren't part of the 100th, he says. Well, not everyone in this show is part of the 100th, and they did fly with them on occasional missions, which is what they show. It's fairly accurate. I like this photo here. It's uh, I'll share it with you here. It is the guy that plays Doctor Who. I'm not a big fan of his right now because he's part of the destruction of a wonderful franchise. But he's standing in front of a P-40, which is one of my favorite fighter planes. It was really the first fighter plane of World War II. Such a cool plane. <clears throat> Was the, uh, this is a stupid question? I'm going to answer it. Uh, thanks to Woodrow Wilson, he resegregated the U.S. military. It had been desegregated after the Civil War, and there were black and white men serving together. And then, uh, before World War One broke out, Wilson resegregated because he was a flaming racist. Um, I mean, big time racist. Oddly, a Democrat. I don't understand that. Um, but he, uh, absolutely hated black people, not a fan of Indians either, American Indians. And, uh, so he resegregated, resegregated the military. And of course, President Roosevelt surely would have stopped that. Now, President Roosevelt as president for a long time, thirties into the forties, all the way up to near the end of world war II, uh, allowed segregation to continue. It was Harry Truman at the end of World War II who resegregated or desegregated the uh, military. And uh, was there rivalry between the U.S. and RAF airmen? The show depicts a testy exchange between RAF and American flyers over a few pints. So does that reflect a wider rivalry between the two allied forces? For the most part, they don't meet that much, says Miller in the show. The British flew by night and the Americans flew by day. The American bases are located largely south of Norwich and the British are up in the north. So they didn't really see much of each other. Um, but I will tell you that the U.S. airmen as well as American soldiers that were preparing for D-Day absolutely bettered a lot of British women. And some <laughs> of them were married. Destruction, man. That's what you need. Mass of the Air's million dollar question is how the men kept getting back in their planes day after day, raid after raid, even after watching their friends get killed with the odds so stacked against them. It was, says Miller, camaraderie that kept them going. Quote, not wanting to fail in front of your buddies was a huge factor in keeping them going. Huge. Not wanting to let them down because the bond was so strong. They knew that. Without it, they couldn't survive on that plane. That's true. Uh, it's true in combat, period, with soldiers. Uh, the first episode of Masters of the Air streams on January 26th for the episodes uh, all the way through March 15th. Uh, what are critics saying about Masters of the Air? Everybody's hailing it because it's brilliant. You know, uh, I don't trust Hollywood reviewers because they will hail anything <laughs> that they're paid for. Yeah. So <laughs> I noticed that it, when you get the early reviews for films from certain magazines, they'll be raving. But then a few weeks later, the true review will come out by a critic and then they'll pan the shit out of it. And we've seen that with like recent films where yes. early on they release all this positive news. And then once they've done what they were expected to do by the studios, they can then be honest and say, yeah, that movie, terrible. 
And they don't apologize for it either. And that pisses me off a little bit. It's annoying. So, it's a very good show. This is a good, not a halfway bad article. There's some stupid questions in there. And the reference of Keegan's role in that stupid Saltburn movie is just insulting to the intelligent. What, that movie is insulting. It's that bad. Winston Churchill at Casablanca latched onto the phrase, bombed them around the clock and agreed to the 8th Air Force doing daylight raids. Yeah. But a lot of uh, our American air crews resented it. But they did it because it was their damn job. It is gross. It's an insult to the, the intelligence of film goers. And people who rave about it are the people I block. I block people who like that kind of movie. It's like people go, what do you, because I tell them I'm block, I block people. And if you get stupid, I just block you. I, I don't subscribe to your stupidity and I don't want to interact with you. Yeah, but you need to engage with people like that. No, not going to do it. No, you don't. I don't want to waste my fucking time. My time is important to me. Maybe your time's not important to you. That's why you don't see me engaging with people on Twitter that get stupid. I'll share other people's stuff doing it. I'll chime in. But I've had people, like I've said something and they somebody said something stupid back. I'll respond only to the people that I'm friends with in that conversation. And I ignore the person saying stupid shit. And then I'll comment on going, I don't interact with stupid people. It's a, it, it, it's a habit that everybody should have. Don't interact with stupid people. Not worth your time. <clears throat> uh, Massey are a little hey, better Connie. than the Pacific. I would say what's they're different. They're different kinds of war films. Um, I have trouble because I consider Band of Brothers my favorite of the soldier films, but I really do like the Pacific. But the Pacific kept something out that pissed me off. Was their training? Yeah, we got that with uh, Band of Brothers. We didn't get that with the Pacific, and I think that was important. They should have had one. They should have done an extra episode to show some of these guys training as Marines. I agree. I, I just it was missing, and I felt it was important. Yeah, you and don't have time out. to get to know the characters. You just get thrown right into it, and you don't know how they yeah. bonded in the first place. And but it's, it's still fucking good. It's still really oh, accurate it too. Uh, fuck. Uh, that movie that we made fun of on here uh, called um, I was at World War II. I, I watched part of it. With, I sped through it. So you didn't have to watch all the stupid shit. Oh, Thin Red Line. Yeah, Thin Red Line. Only showed it because Dale Dye's military work on it was excellent. But that he got to go back and do the story again of Guadalcanal with the Pacific made me so happy for him. Yeah. Because he finally got to tell what happened. It wasn't the army at Guadalcanal. It was the Marines that fought that battle. It's where the nickname Jirene came from. So, ah, Connie's here. Connie Cleary. Hi. Hi, Good Connie. Good morning. So, I, you know, I love all, all three shows. But I think Band of Brothers is my number one favorite. And this one is my number one or number two favorite. And then the Pacific. Uh, I will also say... I agree with Anima on this because we talked about it that I thought I really liked the themes until I played the themes. And then I realized masters of the air has, it has the, the best. best theme song. It really is. The swells in it really happen. Uh, it gets you emotional, makes your chest fill, you know? So if you've not heard the uh, soundtracks, go listen to all three soundtracks. They're all three good soundtracks. But Masters of the Air is the better of the three when it comes to the, the soundtrack. Yeah, you asked me that question, and right away I said Masters of the Air is the best one. And you had another favorite, and then you played all three of them and listened to them, and you were like, yeah, yeah, it, it is the best. Yeah. It was always my favorite. Yeah, it's a good. Uh, very few things. I'm like Scotty, and Captain Dale Die is the Enterprise to me. <laughs> like... Um, <laughs> That scene with the Klingons where they're talking shit about Captain Kirk and he's like, keep it down, boys, keep it down, <laughs> you know, and then finally says something about the Enterprise being a should, shouldn't be, um, isn't a garbage scow, but is the garbage led by the scow. 
Then he gets into a fist fight with them, the Klingons. And that's how I am with Dale Dye, because I, I just, um, I'm so honored that I work for him. It's the greatest experience of my life working for Dale Dye. I hope I get to meet him one day. Yeah, you've got to meet his wife. <laughs> oh, yeah, you tricked you me into did, meeting her. You kind of met him, but it's just like a quick introduction. Well, he had um, technical problems, and we were like two minutes from going live. So yeah, I just said hi. Well, I wanted you to stick it. around so you can meet him, but you know, you're a puss and you run off. I gotta go. I, go I have a business being on that show. I don't belong in it. I don't just sit on a panel to be there. You know that. Did you know Japan conquered all of the islands in the Pacific before the assault on China and before Pearl Harbor, right? Yeah, and a lot of that, you know, because this is why we did the blockades and cut them off from being able to buy metal. They required metal to do what they were doing with the invasion of the Pacific. And we cut them off and, you know, we were warned <clears throat> that they might get angry about it. So everything was there. Going to war with Japan was in the cards. <clears throat> the, um, what they did to Nanking caused us to send pilots over. Caused us to send them over, and we did. The pilots went over there and served with the um, the you know the famous flying tigers. Pappy Boington was one of them, <coughs> and uh, it's one of those films I do enjoy with John Wayne when he did the film about the flying tigers. But um, if you really want to know, watch the uh, first pilot film for Baba Black Sheep. Well, the Japanese didn't recognize um, any treaties, didn't recognize um, the, um, oh, I just forgot the name of it, uh, the rules of war. They ignored it, and they said they, they, they weren't going to obey them. And that's why they committed so many war crimes. And that's why I feel that their treatment was soft compared to what was done to um, the Germans. Rules of engagement? Was that what you meant? No. Um, no, it's a Geneva Convention is what I meant. Oh, Tim under that. understands yeah. my brain. Tim gets my brain. <laughs> the Geneva Convention, they ignored it. They refused it. Um, and they abused prisoners. Oh, Drove sorry. them into the ground. You know, feeding them rice and bugs. Yikes. Yeah, the Geneva Accords. And I've always told people, because we talked about that film, it's actually the single most watched video that we've done for Military Monday, uh, for the channel, period. Over 22,000 people have watched uh, my uh, To Hell and Back video talking about Audie Murphy. That technically Audie Murphy committed a war game when yes. he jumped on that tank destroyer and mounted that 50 caliber and started shooting Germans with it because it's, it's not ball yeah, ammunition, no it's anti-armor. It's anti-armor yeah, rounds. Sure. Yeah. So he's shooting them. Uh, he committed a, a war crime. That's but everybody so in the military said, we're, we're just... Shh. But you know, he, he killed people with armor-piercing rounds. <laughs> but what was the alternative? His guy's being killed. He was a fucking hero. I don't care. Yeah. He saved lives that day. Yes, he and murdered. And he got burned badly. He murdered that. Germans. He murdered them. With those wep that weapon. He did. Absolutely did. But uh, it was to save his guys. And he was wounded. Yeah. He and on top of friends. a, a, a <laughs> tank destroyer that could fucking blow up at any moment. <laughs> like, he didn't think he'd survive balls that. Right there. No, he, he didn't care. That's the weird thing about people. You just don't even think about it. You don't think about things uh, until after it's over. And that's when you begin shaking going, oh, shit. <laughs> I did that? Yes, yeah, so the Japanese were brutal. They considered humans, uh, uh, the allies, subhuman, unworthy of uh, compassion. They didn't believe in surrender. No. The Japanese. Didn't they considered They'd dishonorable. Yourself. Yeah, kill yeah. yourself. Hence the kamikaze. Life didn't matter to them. 
what's this? Uh, but the description brings to mind an H4's army attacking Papua New Guinea and versus Stone Age people. Aside from China, there was there any opposition? Who were the others to? No, absolutely. They would just take control of those islands and they would kill anybody that, that argued with them. And they had no qualms killing any of the inhabitants of these islands. Even if the war ended almost 80 years ago and anyone connected with it are long since dead or very old. Uh, I can tell you my dad hated the Japanese until the day he died. He had every right and, to. <clears throat> you know, Americans were told, you know, everything. No, no, no punches were pulled about the Japanese. And so Americans just hated them, which is why it was so easy for uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt to create camps to put them in. These were American citizens that he's putting in these camps. Didn't care. They were Japanese Americans. I don't believe in hyphenated Americans. Does anybody know what that means? Yeah. Teddy Roosevelt said it. He says there's no such thing as a hyphenated American. No Italian American, no Irish American, no Japanese American. You're either American or you're not. Once you make that decision to become an American, that's what you are. Now, we who that's are born here. I find it so weird how obsessed it. you are with your heritage and then you claim to be that without knowing anything of, about the country, never having been there. You're not. You're American. To European yeah, I, I went to Europe and saw where all my family came from. And thank God I'm American. <laughs> I met the, the Germanic side of my family. They're a bunch of fucking hillbillies. I'm serious. They are, they're from the Isos Lorraine, the German side. And they're just weird fucking people. And I do think there's some inbreeding. <laughs> um, I met the French side of the family. They're very nice. I like them. Uh, then, of course, the Irish, Welsh, and Scottish sides of my family were great. Uh, getting to meet some of them. I was surprised to find Cassells in Ireland. They are There are Cassells in Ireland. Spelled my way with K-I-S-S-E-L-L. Um, let's see. What's going on? Tegan Bush are having a discussion there. Let's see. Yeah, they did a lot of damage in the Pacific. But, you know, we allowed it to happen. You know, turn a blind eye. Not our problem. China was the largest pushback against Japan, but yeah, they were wicked. Um, it took what happened in China to really wake us up, but we still weren't really doing anything. We were helping, but we weren't really doing anything. It took Pearl Harbor to finally wake up the military. And well, Pearl Harbor time was to, kicked to the nuts. Yeah, it's just time to wake up, guys. Kick to the ass, too. Yeah. Um, woke us up and made us realize, I guess we do have a part in this. And then uh, Adolf uh, declared war on us. And I, I've said it, I'll say it time and time again, his biggest fucking mistake. Yes. Should have just kept his nose clean. I hope we can still be friends, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> he was out of his fucking should. mind. Because we love those peanuts. We love peanuts from America. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. No, he he because he had allied with Japan. So when Japan did what they did, he took the next course of action, which just is goofy because we are why the war ended for him. And why he faked killing himself and ended up in oh, South America. We need to go did. back to watching that series, Gary. Oh, we will finish it. I'm just telling you, there is zero evidence that he died in Germany. Zero. Zero, really, yeah. No I was mind blown by evidence. that series. You can't trust witnesses because who were they? They would say anything. The physical evidence doesn't exist. There was never any physical proof that he was ever there. 
the lie about burning his body still would have left remains that you could. There take. was a body, but it was covered, and the they bones found that they found it, it were female. female. Yeah, female. So my theory is he killed his wife or had her killed and got the fuck out of there. He would have done anything to get away. And my history and by teacher the way, actually mentioned that in school, which I'm very thankful for. And here's a history thing for you too. Uh, China suspended a civil war to resist Japan. It's true. Before the advent of communism, all conflicts with China were internal. It wasn't until communism was introduced to China did it start having interests outside its own borders. That's a fact. So um, anyway, we're going to end here quickly because, you know, I know it's not a full two hours, but I want to end on at noon. I'm going to end it now. So we've got uh, four minutes left before we end the show. Um, any questions about the show? Why was yeah, I would never trust it? anybody in <laughs> that was a member of the KGB. And by the way, um, go look it up. Why does Putin walk the way he walks? There's a reason. He has a very odd walk. One arm is always stiff. And... People that were in the KGB that? were trained oh, to walk that, that way. Yeah. Because of their weapon, sidearm. So, but anyway, if you've not watched this, man, red shirt, absolutely go watch this. You can watch on fmovies.to. Make sure you've got an ad blocker on, a good one. And uh absolutely it's it's worthwhile to watch it on fmovies.to. Um, great series. I actually got an Apple Plus account so I could watch the show, and I wanted to be counted with it. I wanted my numbers counted. I would too if I could afford. Problem it. with with those is I can't share a screen with Amazon or Apple or Paramount. So Anima, if Anima is going to watch it with me, we got to watch it through somebody else. Yeah, because all I get because is a black screen. It's fucked up. Paramount, Amazon, and Apple block the sharing feature for your screen for some reason someone told me that they can do it on that uh, other gaming chat software website everybody keeps bringing up i, I, can't, I can't no it's gaming people can chat twitch. That is, no twitch is for gaming it's got a game controller for its logo i can't think of it but it's not what you said discord Discord, thank you. Oh, Discord, uh, that supposedly that you can share screens with Discord, and I don't know how they do it, but apparently Matt Vader can tell one. you that. Not Matt interested. does watch parties. Not interested. But I'm not interested in Discord. Uh, period. Yeah, I'm not either. Just more crap to learn, and I've got enough to learn. <laughs> True. Um. So, uh, any questions? Let's see. Were there questions? I don't see questions. It's in the, the same diatribe between Bush and, and Antique. Yeah, question for Martin. When are you going to do your homework and watch the stuff? You don't tell me what to do. <laughs> she, it, was, it was posed as a question. Right. You framed oh. it as a question. You, you you really think I don't want to watch this? I don't know. I mean, it's an hour per week. And Gary and I have been raving about this ever since episode one. I'm really surprised. And you I have a life, you know? <laughs> yeah, like, I am planning, by the way, to do some uh, videos, uh, little short videos, uh, telling funny little anecdotal father Gerald Weems stories. That's my godfather, Gerald Weems, from Dublin, Ireland. I'm looking oh, see around 3 30. Yeah. Uh, funny stories. I had a lot of fun stories so far. So I'm excited for that. Oh, really cool. Cool. Uh, I just love the show and I'm looking forward to finishing. Um, I don't know. I may start doing the episodes from uh, the Shogun series before we finish it. I think the reason I was kind of holding off was hoping, that, you know, because I wasn't sure if it was going to 
like at some point start sucking. But I got to tell you, I don't think there's any way this show's going to suck at this point. No. It would have started sucking by now, and it's really freaking good. I mean, how many episodes are we in on that? Five? Australia and England were oh. at war with him. Uh, New Zealand, too. So, I don't know if people knew that. But anyway. Uh, that's the end of the show. Uh, I hope everybody had a good time. It's fun talking about this stuff and the other shit that we talked about. Uh, Shogun is brilliant, absolutely. It and is. I want to do. I want to start talking about that on Mondays uh, until the show is over. So I just I love the show. I really do. Anyway, uh, time to get the hell out of here. Uh, I'll see you guys later. Have a great Monday. Uh, for those of you that will be watching later, I I haven't heard anything from Don yet of what we're doing. I tried talking to him yesterday. Uh, he was a little under the weather, so I'm hoping he feels better today. Anyway, I'll talk to you guys later and have a good Monday. Bye, guys. <laughs>